as one who served as chair and as a committee member of AHI, is also an elected fellow. James Carter has uh, co-wrote and edited A Sense of Place, an interpretive planning, plan book, planning handbook, which is a fantastic resource that I personally have made use of and pointed lots of other people to over the years. The book has been translated into French, uh, Chinese, and Czech, showing that he has global connections. <laughs> James has been training interpreters in the UK and Europe for over 25 years, mainly in interpretive planning and interpretive writing. I attended one of James's courses many years ago, and the title of the course, A Way With Words, neatly sums up James's talents. I present James Carter. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I always feel slightly uneasy after an introduction like that. And I feel particularly uneasy at looking at you all sitting at tables decorated with flowers, itching to get at the food. <laughs> I feel rather like the bride's father at a wedding and knowing that, you know, until I've finished my speech, you can't get to eat. So I, I will endeavour not to detain you for too long. This slot, the closing keynote, is an interesting one because you can't really prepare for it without having been there. It's a bit like interpretation. Until you've gone through it, you don't know what ideas you're going to get from it. And so what I wanted to do with this closing slot was to just run through a few of the key strands, a few of the key ideas that, for me, have come out of what we've been doing for the last few days. I'm going to invite you to do your own little bit of reflection on that as well. And then I want to finish by just thinking about where those key strands might take us, what we might do with those key strands after this event's finished. So, to begin with, these key ideas, the key strands that have struck me as being about this relationship between interpretation and encouraging people to become global citizens. I haven't said make people become global citizens deliberately, and I'll come back to that later. The first of these, for me, was mentioned within the first few minutes of us being together in this hall. Michael Glenn used the word respect. And that, to me, is one of the cornerstones of everything that we've been talking about for these few days. We're looking at encouraging respect for our environment, a respect for each other and for others, and I would also suggest a respect for our audience, an idea that I hope I'll come back to in a wee bit. The second idea that runs through the few days for me is the idea of how central inviting people to an experience that might be new for them is. I loved Ted's analogy. Where's Ted? Is Ted still here? Ted Cable. Um, I really liked his piece of advice that one of the things you should do in order to become a global citizen was to travel. Even if that travel was to places that you didn't know about or to ideas that you didn't know about were ne that were near home. Travel is a way to learn respect for our environment, for other people and for others. And I think it's a part of our job as interpreters to take people on journeys, to give them experiences linked with interesting ideas, linked with themes. And our job as interpreters is to introduce those experiences and to link them with themes by being third word that emerges from me constantly from these few days, by being a facilitator, someone who makes something easy, who helps something to happen. That word has been mentioned more times. I've lost count of how many times I've heard that word facilitator or facilitation. Paul and Meta in their keynote yesterday mentioned it. And I think it's a really interesting change from how interpretation might have been seen from the role, the role that an interpreter might have been seen to have 20 years ago, 
when we might have said that an interpreter was a teacher or an interpreter was somebody who translated something in a foreign language, scientific language or an academic specialist language into something that the audience might understand. Now we say ourselves as interpreters, as facilitators, helping people to have those experiences and find meanings in them. So if interpretation is partly about experiences, we've all been having experiences during these few days. Um, tasters of experiences. We were at uh, Turesta yesterday, we were introduced to the idea that what we were being shown was a taster of Turesta. Um, and a conference, I think, is always a taster of experiences, a taster of places. So I'd like to invite you now to do a little bit of reflection for yourselves on these last few days and to think of those experiences you've had, the places you've seen, the projects you've heard about, which one would you choose to go back to or to find out more about if you could? What have you heard about in these last few days that you'd think, I'd really like to come back here, I haven't seen quite enough. I just need to take a few more photographs in that little visitor centre at Tourista or um, whatever it might be, what would you go back to or what project that you've heard about would you really choose to visit if you can or to find out more about it? Can you just have a quick conversation with somebody sitting next to you? Just a minute and a half, two minutes, just to share. What would you go back to? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I need I need the little cowbell from the Oslo skiing um, from the Oslo skiing championships. Thank you very much. I'm sure you can continue those conversations uh, once I've let you get at the food. Um, thinking about experience, I want to just move on now to looking at where might those strands, those ideas that I've outlined, where might they take us in the future? And I'm hoping to leave you with a few questions that might be circulating in your heads as you leave here tomorrow. Before they do that, I would just like to share with you something of my own experience, my own taster of what we've seen today. When I was a child, um, a friend of my family's gave me a book called Finn Family Moomin Troll by Tove Janssen. And I loved it. I, and I subsequently read several other of her books about this family of... Um, how many people here know the Moomin Troll? <laughs> <laughs> stories, okay, a lot. That's good. For those of you who don't know the Moomin Troll stories, they are about a family of um, trolls, very cuddly and lovable trolls, rather than the big fierce ones that hide under bridges and eat you. Um, and they have adventures in a Swedish stroke Finnish landscape that for me was quite magical. And they have wonderful experiences in that natural environment, playing in the, in the, in the sea, going on wonderful adventurous midnight camping expeditions where they drink raspberry juice, which I thought was a wonderfully exotic thing to do. <laughs> and I think they're also quintessentially Swedish in their experiences enjoying these wonderful, sunlit, pristine environments where they drink. Um, there's always something to drink and a little something to eat. <laughs> but it's perhaps just fresh enough for you to need a blanket <laughs> to put round your shoulders. So for me, coming to Sweden, this is sort of a taster that I had of Sweden when I was a child, and for me, coming to Sweden reinforces those impressions. But our experiences of being in the environment can also be a little uncomfortable. This is little Mai, one of the other characters from Moomin, Moomin, the Moomin stories, who's fallen into a pond and is not very happy. She has to be said she's not 
generally a very happy character, but she's particularly unhappy when she falls in the pond. And introducing people to new experiences can mean that they are uncomfortable. I was intrigued this morning in Torfin and Brita's session to have that possibility specifically discussed. As we introduce people to new experiences, that can be uncomfortable and unsettling. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do that. You can learn a lot from being introduced to things that you initially find uncomfortable. But we need to be sensitive to that possibility and be able and open to helping people through that uncomfortable phase. That leads me on to the first of the questions that I just want to leave you with. We've heard a lot of inspiring projects that I think go a long way towards helping people to be citizens of the world, to make connections with the environment and to have respect for the environment and for each other. But a lot of them have been projects that are intense and personally mediated in the way that we communicate with people. Projects working with school children face to face with the opportunity to respond to questions, be sensitive to exactly how they are responding to particular experiences. And the question I'd like to leave you with is, how can we bring those qualities to bear in the interpretation that I suspect is more commonly the case for many of our audiences, a panel, a visitor center, a leaflet that you come across in passing, pay only peripheral attention to, if your peripheral and central routes of, in, of attention are covered in Sam's book, um, pay only peripheral or fleeting attention to, and it's a self-directed experience without the luxury of having a facilitator standing by you, behind you, or even in front of you. <laughs> the second thing I want to look at is that role of being a facilitator. It's often said that a facilitator needs to be neutral and objective. And I'm not sure that that's actually true when it comes to our role as interpreters. I think we frame experience. We offer people a particular point of view, a particular way of looking by the way that we choose the experience we offer to them and the ideas that we choose to introduce to them. And I think we do that even when we are presenting or encouraging a dialogue. I was struck by Jane Sever's presentation about a project in Newfoundland that encouraged people to listen to differing views and to even contribute their own, but did so around a structure of concepts and ways of thinking that she as the interpretive planner had introduced. So as a facilitator, we are not completely neutral. We have values, even if we are wanting to encourage people to debate a subject. Values, I know, is another theme that has been discussed in the conference, and I'm afraid I wasn't in that session. But to me, that notion of values and the values which we bring to our work is central to the whole idea that interpretation might encourage people to be citizens of the world. Interpretation is political. Heritage is political. And if you have any doubt about that, you need only think to what's happening in Istanbul at the moment in Gezi Park and Taksim Square. I know that these protests are really expressing a much deeper discontent with the government and its style. But the flashpoint for them has been the proposed destruction of one of the only green spaces left in Istanbul city centre and a space with a strong tradition of a venue for political protest and communal gathering to destroy that park by setting up a large shopping mall based on a piece of Ottoman heritage, a barracks that was there until the 1940s. Heritage is political, and our engagement with it as interpreters is political. For me, and I'm speaking personally now, as I will 
in several other parts, well, as I have been doing all the way through, as you've probably gathered. For me, it's essentially a liberal activity. I think as interpreters, we have one foot in the Enlightenment, that great philosophical flowering of the 18th century that prized the rational, evidence-based understanding, debate based on respect. We have one foot in the in, in values of the Enlightenment and its liberal approach. And we also have one foot in Romanticism, perhaps particularly when it comes to interpreting and introducing people to the natural heritage. That position with one foot in the Enlightenment and one foot in Romanticism is sometimes a little bit uncomfortable and um, we may be in danger of sometimes of doing the splits. But that's where I think we are and as I say, I think for me that's an essentially liberal activity. And the question I'd like to, another question I'd like to leave you with is, where are those values that underpin what we do as interpreters defined? I think it's too easy to assume that we all share a set of values that underpin what we do as interpreters. And I wonder, and this is a question I really don't feel I have the answer to, but I think it's worth considering, whether the values that underpin interpretation and its goals and aims need to be in some kind of code of good practice. Should it be possible for somebody who calls themselves an interpreter to work on developing a museum like the Creation Museum in Kentucky that presents the life of the dinosaurs as understood through a literal interpretation of the book of Genesis? Should it be possible for somebody who calls themselves an interpreter to work on a redisplay of the Vasa that trumpeted Sweden's triumphs over Denmark? in the 17th century and attempted to suggest that there was still some supremacy in Sweden's culture over Denmark's. As I say, I don't have answers to these questions, but I think they're worth considering. <laughs> and apart from the political nature of interpretation, I think it has a spiritual goal. The work of connecting people with a place, the work of connecting, of that are connecting people with the environment of which they are part, the work of connecting people with each other, the work of encouraging respect between peoples and cultures, those to me are very close to the values that have underpinned all religious activity and spiritual activity. And I think perhaps we need a little bit of humility in approaching that role. When I first saw the theme for the conference and read the conference brochure, I was both excited and also a little bit dismayed because I read that the conference wanted to explore how interpretation of cultural and natural heritage can develop a shared sense of belonging, of ownership, of responsibility and of mutual understanding. And that the conference would look at how interpreters can foster understanding of different and even conflicting heritage and cultures. That's a lot to ask. <laughs> That's a lot to ask of an intense mediated experience with a guide, a facilitator right by your side. It's an immense task to ask of a panel that people glance at for a minute and a half while they're standing at a viewpoint. I don't say that we shouldn't have those values and those aspirations in our heads, but I think we need to be a bit realistic about just how much what we do can achieve and to recognize that it's a tiny part of how people's attitudes are shaped. It may potentially be a powerful one, but it's a tiny one. And in this, I speak from a United Kingdom perspective. In the United Kingdom, the BBC television on primetime television now has programs in which you can get right inside a bird's nest. There are programs every night called Spring Watch, which are all about what is happening in wildlife in spring. There are other programs 
that look at heritage buildings and invite viewers to vote for which buildings should receive funds to be conserved. The, the landscape of heritage understanding in the United Kingdom is really, I would suggest, quite high. Interpretation is a small part of many, many other influences on the way people think. And I'd like to close with a final thought about that notion of humility in our role. And it comes back to thinking about experience and what people do with it. How people make meaning from the experiences and the ideas that we give them. We may well have, in fact, I think we need to have in our heads a clear sense of what's the idea, what's the theme that we'd like people to engage with. But what they actually take away is their own. What they do with it is individual and personal. And I was reminded about a, a poem that I've read and I've desperately tried to find the poem so that I can read it to you and I haven't been able to do that, which I apologize, but if there's a chance to write this up, I shall do so and put it in the written version of the paper. And this poem was a very moving account by the poet who's seeing his son off. His son's going to university and he's saying goodbye to his son at the station. And he describes this and then the poem goes into a section where he compares seeing his son off with launching a ship. And he says, you don't launch a ship with a push. You take away the blocks that are holding it on the slipway and you let it slide into the water of its own accord. I think we as interpreters are responsible for setting up the slipway and choosing the direction it's facing in. But we then need just to take the blocks away and let our audiences find their own way into the water and find their own voyage. We can, of course, also do what you do when you launch a ship, which is to give them our blessing. And I'd like to leave you with a final thought that I hope that this dinner and the end of the conference can be a way of removing the chocks from this conference and letting you as interpreters slide down the slipway and into the ocean of the future. Thank you for listening. <laughs>